There is a garden, there is a city, and there's a kingdom of God. And it is beautiful, and he is bringing it right now into our midst. One of the last prayers Jesus prayed on earth was for his disciples to be one in spirit. He prayed for us that they would be brought to complete unity. Though the world is divided politically, racially, and economically, divided by gender, ethnicity, and social status, we will, will be united, undivided, undivided because, because of Jesus. Jesus. We will come together with our different cultures, languages, and gifts to be one body, to laugh together, cry together, and build each other up. We will show love, acceptance, grace, and humility to one another as we worship the true King. For we are undivided through Christ. Well, good morning, everybody, both right here on site and online. And I just want to add a thought to what Kendall had mentioned. Uh, not only do we have a number of people going from our congregation over to Sulaymaniyah, but they're going to be joined by some medical personnel from uh, Jordan and then also from Holland. So very, very exciting seeing like this multi-national uh, group coming together, and we're really committed to just bringing the love and grace and good news of Christ to that part of the world. And in case you haven't heard, uh, there uh, next Sunday, beginning at 4 o'clock in the afternoon, going through the evening, Franklin Graham and his ministry has an event going on at the York Fairgrounds, and that's uh, free of charge. Anybody is invited to that. And again, that's next Sunday, uh, beginning at 4 o'clock. Uh, some different music groups. Uh, Franklin Graham has a message, and you can find some more information about that on the website if you are interested. We are beginning, and we're going to run the whole way up to the week before Thanksgiving. We are beginning a brand new series called Undivided. We're going to be looking at Romans chapter 12 through 15. There is a problem that is not quite as old as dirt. Now, that's Genesis 1, but it is as old as sin, and that is Genesis chapter 3. <clears throat> It is a big problem. It is a persistent problem. It is a problem that causes all kinds of anxiety and agony uh, for people everywhere. And that's what we're going to be looking at. That's what Paul actually kind of addresses in Romans chapters 12 through 15. There was a, there was a man who was doing a solo sailing uh, adventure, and he hit a terrible storm driven really off course and basically was wound up shipwrecked on one of those deserted, uninhabited islands. And he was there for a long, long time, 20 years. Eventually, another ship, and it's really off the tr chart, of course, another ship is, is going by, and he sends up some distress signal, and they actually send a crew in there to see what's going on. And he says, I have been here for 20 years, and they said, man, we will do whatever we can to get you home as soon as we can. And God said, I am ready to go. However, let me go get a couple of things from my house. And they said, your house? And he said, well, yeah, I'm a construction person, and I had all this time. I figured I might as well have a nice place to live, so I built a house. And uh, come on up. So they went up and he had built a really nice home. And they're looking around and marveling at what he was able to do. And, and one of the rescue uh, crew looks through the window and they see another uh, building over there. And they say, well, what's that? He said, well, you have to know I'm a really committed Christian and I had to have a church to worship. So after I built my house, I built myself a church. And they said, well, can we see it? He said, love to show you my church. And so they go over and they're looking at his church and they're marveling. And, and one of the people looks out another window and sees an, another building over there. And they say, well, what's that? And he says, well, that's the church I used to worship at. I didn't like how they did things there. <laughs> okay, that's the problem at as old as Genesis chapter 3. We just don't know how to get along very well with people that are not like we are. All right, what I'm going to do is I want to, uh, I'm going to take you back to 1973. And I'm just going to be there for a moment. Then we're going to go back to 49 AD when Paul writes his letter to the Galatians, his first letter. Then we're going to go back a little bit further to Jesus in 30 AD. And then after that, we're going to wind up moving into Romans. Uh, uh, we're going to move into the book of Romans. What happened in 1973? There was a well-known uh, missiologist. He had been a missionary in India for many, many years, learned an awful lot of things. He came back to the United States to become a professor of missions and church growth at a seminary. And in 1973, a book was released on church growth. How do churches grow? His name was Donald McGavran, and in that book, he had come up with an idea that he had just seen in operation all the time in India. And he, he had a kind of a fancy word that was called the homogenous unit principle. Fancy phrase, but here's what it simply means, is we prefer to be with people who are an awful lot like we are. And we find it difficult to be with people who are not like we are. 
And that is true in churches as it is true anywhere else. And so McGovern discovered that the churches that grow fastest are those churches that are they're basically the people are really alike. And the more different people are, then the slower those churches grow. And listen, I just want to say that was right. That's true. But but why is that true? Well, it's true because of Genesis chapter 3, a problem that's been around since sin entered the world. And it's just that we don't get along very well with other people. Now, in, um, in 49 AD, Paul writes his very first letter, and it's the letter to the Galatian church. Now, Paul's been doing some of his ministry for a little while, but, but there's a lot of things that are, are fresh on his mind and he's communicating a couple of things. So let me just read these verses. I know you guys know them. We talk about them a lot at Living Word. So in Christ Jesus, Paul says, you are all children of God through faith. For all of you who were baptized into Christ, you have, been cl- uh, you have clothed yourself with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, not slave nor free, nor is there male or female. You are all one in Christ Jesus. I tell you what, when, when that message was given in, in, that, in that century, it was revolutionary, it was radical, it was refreshing, and it was completely unknown. Nobody was giving a message like that anywhere else in that culture. The Apostle Paul wound up coming in with this message that would have been almost shocking to people, but it was so full of life. It just began to create a new kind of community called the church. Now, Paul did not come up with this idea. He simply was reflecting and putting into practice what Jesus had talked about a number of decades earlier in about 30 AD. Now, in the Gospel of John, there is a couple of chapters laid in the book that are this magnificent prayer by Jesus. And Jesus ends the prayer with something really striking. And I think you all know that when somebody's giving a communication, whether it is written or spoken, what you say first is important, but the last word you say is most important because what people remember best is what is said last. And so therefore, I think it is very striking what Jesus says the very last thing in his prayer. And this is in, um, in John chapter 17. So uh, talking to the Father, Jesus says, my prayer is not for them alone. He's referring to his immediate disciples. And by the way, they had some real difficulties getting along with one another because they came out of really different groups. So Father, I'm not praying just for for this group here, but I'm also praying for all of those who are going to believe in me uh, through their message. And so like Jesus is praying through the years, praying through the century, praying for the future of the church. My prayer is that they, that all of them may be one. Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. That's a pretty striking oneness that Jesus is praying for. May they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. Now, I've given them the glory you gave me that they may be one as we are one. Hear that phrase again. Jesus wants you and I to be one as he and the Father are. I in them, you and me, so they may be brought to complete unity. I mean, this is extraordinary language, complete unity. And then listen, then the world will know that you have sent me. Jesus is literally putting a stake in the ground saying this, uh, the way the world is going to know that I, Jesus Christ, am really who I say I am, it's going to be by the complete unity and love that this group of people called my followers have for one another. Then they're going to know that you have sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. And that's just extraordinary language from Jesus. And may I want to say, it is one of the prayers of Jesus that is still most unfulfilled. And it is a prayer that the world is waiting to see fulfilled. Okay, so 1973, Donald McGavern, AD 49, Paul to the Galatians, uh, Jesus in 30 AD. Now let's come up to about 55 AD, and Paul is writing to the church in Rome. And the church that Paul is writing to is a large, okay, Rome is a large metropolitan area, cosmopolitan. It's the, it's the center of the Roman Empire. It is a happening place. There are all kinds of different people there. And there are, are churches. There are, are churches of Gentiles and Romans. There are churches full of, of Jewish converts to Christianity. But, but these churches are not getting along very well. They're, they're divided. Now, here's what's pretty fascinating. Uh, In the early church, you know, Galatians, the problem was this. The Jewish Christians were looking down on the Gentile Christians. 
The Jewish Christians had some real problems with, with these Gentiles coming into the, to the faith. But now in the city of Rome, you know, some years later, it's the exact opposite problem. It's the Romans, it's the Gentiles that they're having real trouble about the Jews and the Jews who have become Christians. And, and so there's just conflict going on. And Paul is writing to a divided church. Now, you understand that there, there's, there's no perfect church. Uh, by the way, in Acts chapter 2, verses 42 to 47, and we talk about those verses a lot, the church was on its very best behavior. Wow, you know, the, you know, the, the resurrection had just happened. The Spirit of God had come. There was a dynamic life of God just spilling out everywhere. The church was filled with the presence of the Spirit of God, and they, they were just on their very best behavior. They were tracking, and it didn't last. You know, as we went through our Acts series, you know, last year, you know that there were all kinds of issues that were appearing in the church. And basically what we understand is there's no such thing as a perfect church. And yet, you know, Paul really had these great ideals. And so when he would write his letters, he would write letters to the church saying, well, hey, listen, you know, there's a couple of things you're doing good, but there's some other areas where we're falling short. So let me just remind you once again, this is you know, how we need to think and this is how we need to live. Now, Romans... Man, it is considered the masterpiece of Paul's letters. Uh, I mean, it, it is the letter that just ranks higher than, than all the others uh, in, the, in the minds of so many people. Uh, many of you are familiar with Romans. Others of you might not be familiar with that letter at all. But uh, real quickly, uh, chapters 1 through 11 are a unit. And in chapters 1 through 11, Paul is giving magnificent Christian theology, worldview, the best belief that is a part of this thing called Christianity. Now then, in chapters 12 through 15, he moves into giving some very practical, um, relational, ethical wisdom for how we do life together. And then chapter 16, there's a bunch of greetings to people and say, hey, and God willing, I'm going to come out and see you. I uh, hope to get there. So, so historically, most of us, we focus on chapters 1 through 11. It's this amazing theology. And then we see this practical wisdom as sort of like the tag on. Paul had to get a couple practical words in. And what I'd like to suggest is there's another way that might even be a better way to see it. What if chapters 12 through 15 are what Paul was most interested in? How we do life together as a new community built on Christ. And, and before he gets that, he said, and let me tell you, this is the basis, this is the foundation for why we can do this kind of life together. So that's what I'm going to look at today. This is the one day that we're just taking a real high altitude, uh, look at a lot of stuff. And then all the rest of the weeks, we're going to look at a couple of verses at a time in 12 through 15. But let's just do this sort of high altitude skim through about the letter to the Romans. Romans chapter 1 through 3, Paul is saying, hey, we are all in this together because of this terrible predicament called sin. And I'll tell you what, chapters 1, 2, and 3, man, there it is just a sobering description of what sin has done to the human race. But let me just read you one verse. Um, Jews and Gentiles alike are all under the power of sin. There is no difference between Jew and Gentile, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. In the early 1900s, a Christian essayist, really well-known, G.K. Chesterton, wrote a lot of novels, a great sense of humor. He wound up saying, you know, there's only really one doctrine of the Christian religion that you can prove easily, and that's the doctrine of original sin. Because all you have to do is look around, and everybody's sinning. So we don't even have to prove that one, it's just evident. And we've used this before, but the, the London Times had done a series of essays where they invited a number of very prominent people to write an essay, What's Wrong with the World? And, you know, G.K. Chesterton wrote the shortest answer. He said, Dear Sirs, I am sincerely yours, G.K. Yeah, he was spot on. You know, I'm what's wrong with the world. Well, that was in the early 1900s. Uh, and, and, and the early new millennium that we are in, we don't kind of think that way anymore. You know, very few of us think about our own sin, but whoa, are we ever aware of the original sin in other people? Hey, I'm okay, but they're not okay out there. And especially in the group that you're a part of, we're doing okay, but boy, that other group that's really different from us, no, I mean, that's where the problem is. There was a, a Pew Research study just done this summer. I mean, this is really fresh. And they surveyed Democrats and Republicans and there were a couple of things they were asking about. Who has the greater problem, Democrats or Republicans? And they said, who has the greater problem with uh, being closed-minded, dishonest, immoral, unintelligent, and lazy? 
Guess who the Democrats identified as having the greater problem? And can you guess who the Republicans identified as having the greater problem? Thinking, who in the world paid for that particular survey? It's so self-evident. But you see, we all believe in original sin. It's just that we believe it for the other person, not for ourselves. And in other words, if we were going to write an essay, if the New York Times submitted, you know, uh, invited essays, we would say, what's wrong with the world? They are, sincerely me. Now, what the Apostle Paul is saying in Romans chapter 1, 2, and 3, we are all in this together. What's wrong with the world? We together. We are what is wrong with the world. And I'll tell you what, when you understand that you're a part of what's wrong with the world, it starts to create some humility, maybe some humanity. It creates some patience. It creates some understanding. It might even create some empathy, because we are all in the same terrible predicament together. Now, Paul continues in chapter 3 and also chapter 4 and says, we are all in this together. Well, in what together, Paul? Well, we, we are together as having received a great salvation by grace through faith. All, all, all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. A person is justified by faith, not by the works of the law. Is God the God of Jews only? Is he not the God of Gentiles too? Yes, of Gentiles too, since there is only one God who will justify. Jay had us focus on this in the midst of song number three. The cross is the great equalizer of humanity. As we stand before the cross, we stand together as equals before the cross. As we stand before the cross, we stand as equals who are in this terrible condition called sin. As we come to the cross, we stand together as people that we can bring absolutely nothing to the cross other than our brokenness and our lostness. And then at the cross, what we discover we are given is this this free justification. We're given forgiveness, grace, mercy, love, healing. We get that at the cross. That's what we all get together at the cross. Every single one of us. Doesn't matter what group you're part of. The cross was a great equalizer. Could you imagine? And actually, I would like to try and imagine this. You got to do a little bit of work for a moment. Could you imagine if we are standing together before the cross and Jesus is on the cross And as we're together standing, you realize that the person beside you thinks pretty differently than you do on some stuff you care about. You don't want to be too close to that person as you're standing before the cross. Isn't that ludicrous that we would think that way? But you know what? We're never away from the cross. Because Jesus says, I want you to carry your cross. The, 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 the supreme symbol of you as my followers are people that you, you are saved by grace through faith because of the cross and you carry your cross for the rest of your life. So everywhere you go, together we are with others who we are all carrying our cross together. It is the great equalizer because there we who brought nothing receive everything. And, you know, if I could use some of the language that every, I mean, I haven't used this for a long time. It just seems really old-fashioned. But, you know, sometimes at weddings you would say, hey, those whom God has joined together, let no one tear asunder. You know, you ever hear that at a wedding? Not too much anymore. But I would like to say, those whom God has joined together at the cross, let nothing else in this world try to tear asunder. Because the cross that we have together, the unity that we have in Christ at the cross is far greater than anything else, any other ideology, any other idea that would seek to divide us and say, we do not want to be together. Does that make sense? Paul is saying, we are all in this together. We have received this wonderful grace of God by faith because of what Jesus did on the cross. He then moves on. Chapters 5 through 7, we are in this together. We're in what together, Paul? Well, we are in this wonderful new life in Christ together. Uh, Now, I I, I mean, I just had to pick some verses, but in the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life, for sin shall no longer be your master. Now listen to this, because you are not under law, you are under grace. You are under grace. Together, we are all under grace. We are under grace. We, we, we live in grace. We live by grace. We live surrounded by grace. Grace is the place where we live. 
Together, all of us, we live in this place called grace. And so therefore, the single most important thing we may need to do living in the place called grace is be grace givers to one another. Of course, there are going to be people who will say things that you think are just stupid. <laughs> Give them grace. Okay? Of course, there are going to be some people who have some opinions that are really different from yours and they might even make you a little bit angry. Give them grace. Of course, there are going to be people that do some things that you find offensive and irritating and annoying. Give them grace. Of course, there are going to be people who vote for who you think is a disastrously wrong candidate. Give them hell. No, <laughs> no, don't do that. That's what the world does. The world's great at giving people hell. The devil's pretty good at giving people hell as well. And Jesus said to some religious leaders, hey, you know, I know, you're, I know your father must be the devil because you're really good at giving people hell. Stop giving people hell. Give them heaven. Give them grace. Give them love. Give them mercy. Because that's what it means to be in this new life of Christ. Oh, hey, by the way, can I tell you, this gets really hard. There's going to be some people who won't give you grace. Give them grace anyway. I mean, that, look, this is the distinctive stuff of the church. I mean, this is the stuff that Paul, when he wrote his first letter to the Galatians, I mean, he was already working through this. He already knew it. But by the time he's writing to the Romans, man, he is so convinced of this. He lives in this more than ever. He now knows more fully than ever what the cross means. It's a great equalizer. He knows what grace means. It's the great equalizer. I mean, he, his whole theology is so much richer and deeper and just wants to get it out to people. You know, this is what we are all in together. Chapter 8, we are in this together. Paul, what are we in together? Well, we, we have the same Spirit of God living inside of us. For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit. Hey, you're God's kids. And now if we're children, then we're heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. And it just goes on and on. You know, we're, we're, we're kids together in, in, in the family. You know, I know probably most of you here, when you're a kid, you had some siblings, brothers and sisters. You guys ever play the game, hey, I'm mom's favorite. Dad likes me more than he likes you. Now, I knew my mom and dad liked my brother more than me. Uh, they, they proved that every time report cards came due. He got so much more money than I did. Now, he had A's and I had C's, but, but they just obviously loved him more. Hey, listen, I just want you to understand, if you're a king's kid, he doesn't love any of his kids more than the other. He loves you all the same. Remember the language from the shack, if you ever saw that movie, you know, um, especially fond of you. God is especially fond of you and you and you. He's especially fond of, he's especially fond of all of you. And there's nobody that he plays favorites with. We're all in this together. We're in the family. We're not just a community. We're the family of the king. Romans chapter 9 through 11. We are all in this together. Paul, what are we in together? Well, we are in this amazing plan that God has, a sovereign God bring together Jews and Greeks. And, and so, like, here's a question everybody was asking. So, like, all right, what place does the Jewish convert have in God's plan? What place does the Gentile convert have in God's plan? What place does that pagan who came out of this really weird, messed up religion have in God's plan? What place do, do blacks and whites and rich and poor and young and old and, and any, kind of, any kind of polarity you can imagine, what place do they have in God's plan? And Paul says the answer is real simple. Their place is together in God's plan. Everybody together in God's plans. And I tell you what, chapters 9... 10 and 11 are the most confusing and complicated <clears throat> that there is in Romans. It is hard stuff. And you almost know, I mean, Paul's like kind of struggling. How do I express this? We're in this place together to these people that are so divided. 
But by the time he's done just saying, we're in it together, we're in it together, he finishes with this doxology. It's like one of the, the most beautiful praises for about five or six verses in all of the Bible. I mean, Paul, as he thinks we are all in this together, God's plan and purpose is to, to build something brand new, something the world has never seen, something the world would have never expected, something the world doesn't even understand. God's doing it, and we're a part of what God is doing. Oh, praise be to God forever and ever. And now we come to Romans chapter 12 through 15, which is where we are actually going to spend now, you know, the next eight weeks, just something like verse by verse. Because Paul says, uh, if we are in this together in all these different ways, and I, by the way, I only mentioned a few. There's a lot more that I could have mentioned throughout, throughout Romans 1 through 11. But if all these things are so, how then shall we live together? And Romans 12 through 15 is going to be his brilliant, inspiring, robust answer for how we live together as God's people. Now, there's a, there's a phrase that we will often use. I know I have. I'm sure you have. Uh, I've used it uh, in some conversations with other people, and at times other people use that phrase with me. And I, I got to thinking about that phrase this week. And I actually thought about it in a couple ways that I hadn't thought about it before. So here's the phrase. So you've been in a heated conversation with somebody. It's not gone very well. You're on really different sides of the issue. And you've gotten a little bit ticked and peeved and angry with one another. And then one of you finds, oh, we just have to agree to disagree. Let's just agree to disagree. You ever say that? Or has anybody ever said that to you? Hey, let's just agree to disagree. That's stupid. You don't have to agree to disagree. You're already disagreeing. That's a given. What you need to do is you need to make this agreement. Hey, let's agree to love one another with this disagreement. That's the agreement you need to make. Let's agree to love one another. I, boy, I've been in some conversations with people that, you know, it's been intense. And, and they said, well, Pastor Brian, oh, we just have to agree to disagree. Now, here's what they meant. I don't want to talk to you anymore. I don't want to be around you. I don't even think I like you, and they left. Okay, I'm, I need to come clean. Now, this is for none of you, of course. But I've been in a couple of conversations where I've said, well, let's just agree to disagree, and I'm thinking, I would prefer never to have to talk to you again. <laughs> All right? Look, okay, that's the problem. That's as old as a sin, Genesis chapter 3. We just find it hard to get along with people that we're having disagreements with. But I've also been in conversations that have been pretty intense, and the person said, well, hey, we're just going to have to agree to disagree, but here's what they meant. Now, Brian, you know, I really love you, and I respect you, and I trust you, and I know we don't see some things eye to eye, but that really doesn't matter, because there's other stuff that matters even more. And there's some times when I've had some conversations with people where that's exactly what I meant. So you see, what, what we really need to say is, hey, let's agree to love one another when we have disagreements. Do you know that Jesus never made unity dependent upon us agreeing with each other all the time? Aren't you glad a marriage doesn't depend upon you being in agreement with each other all the time? I mean, there wouldn't be any marriages that last if, if that's what, what was needed. Of course, we're not going to agree. By the way, Jesus did not even say that unity depends upon you affirming what the other person believes. You don't have to affirm the other person to love them. You don't have to, to, to go along with what they say to love them. You don't have to do that. But Eunice says you have to love them anyway. You have to, you know, give them grace anyway. You have to say, hey, before the cross, I know we got some pretty strong different opinions, but listen, we're all equal before the cross. We, we're all these broken people, and we've all received grace and mercy and love. And, and you're really, when you think about it, we're all just beggars who are joyfully telling other beggars where we found the bread of life. That kind of unity is what the church is all about. That's what Paul is going to get into Romans 12 through 15. He is going to get practical. He is going to get right down into specific issues. I mean, he is going to make us squirm. He's going to make us feel uncomfortable. But, but he's doing this because like this is, this is how we need to live. And by the way, do you know that there is no other organization anywhere at any time in the world that has the message that makes unity like this possible. There is nobody else because that message, and this is what makes the church unique. This is, this is all we got. 
And if we let this go, we ain't got nothing to give the world. Here's what we've got. We've got Jesus. We've got Jesus on the cross. We've got Jesus risen from the dead. We've got Jesus who has sent the Spirit to adopt us all into his kingdom. We've got grace, love, mercy, and forgiveness. That's what we've got, and that's what the world needs. Can I hear an amen? amen. Let's pray. Oh, God, thank you. Thank you for my brothers, my sisters, my family, uh, the people that are here. We are together because of you. We are together because of the cross. Nothing to the cross we bring. Man, we're just clinging as hard as we can to your grace and mercy and love. And uh, Jesus, we uh, right now, as Living Word Community Church, we know that in 30 AD, you prayed for Living Word Community Church, September 2022. You prayed for us right here, right now, that we would be one in the way that you and the Father are one. It is staggering what you invite us to. It is a privilege. It is a joy. And we say, yes, Lord, yes. And so now, Lord, we know that we need to become grace givers. Help us be grace givers. Uh, we know we need to become full of love and mercy and forgiveness and patience and trust and gentleness. Oh, Lord, so much. And, and you're going to show us that in verse after verse in these weeks ahead. I pray that you're going to find hearts that are wide open, receptive to be something uh, just revolutionary, radical, and refreshing, and so rare, but the world is still waiting to see it. To you be the glory forever and ever. Let's worship.